<clears throat> cool. You ready? Yeah. Hey, everybody. We're gonna get started. <clears throat> um, I wasn't trying to get anybody to sit or anything. Feel free to stand. Uh, idle, stand awkwardly in places. You guys are looking good. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for coming. This is Code Youngstown. Um, my name is Nicholas Sarah. This is Joe Dunko. We primarily run these kind of things. Um, so uh, normally, we kind of just operate as a sort of a software developer user group. Our main goal here is to link software developers, hackers, programmers, coders, uh, designers, project managers, anybody that's in sort of the software space. We try to link those people together, uh, bring them together for networking purposes, for hiring purposes, to um, link people to jobs, uh, to help people that uh, need help, you know, even if it's with you know, programming questions or if it's just with trying to figure out um, things locally as far as who's hiring, stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's really great to see so many people in the room. We had one in the summer, was our summer mixer. We had a huge turnout too, uh, a whole bunch of uh, industry professionals, a whole bunch of students just trying to break into uh, the industry, stuff like that. So um, it's, it's really great to see. Uh, we always get a pretty good crowd to these kind of things. So uh, thank you for coming. Um, what we normally do is we, we host events. Um, this, this one tonight is lightning talks. We've done it once before, and it was actually really great. Um, normally, we do uh, two mixers per year, the summer and the winter mixer. And those are just purely networking, social, food, uh, hanging out, collaboration, stuff like that. And then a few times a year, we usually do some kind of tech talk event. So um, we've had tech talks on everything from uh, front end microservices to uh, you know, back end in Python to design systems to um, just, just all kinds of stuff, project management. We had a really great project management talk. So um, one thing we always like to plug is if you have an idea for an event, if you want to be a speaker, if you have something you want to show off, we usually only have people fill like a 30 to 45 minute time slot you know, with Q&A. So um, just, just contact us and let us know, and we'd love to have you uh, give a presentation on anything, whether it be technical design, um, showing off a library, showing off you know, whatever you can think of. Um, just let us know. Um, and, and with that, um, Easiest way to get a hold of us is in our Slack. Go to codeyoungstown.com and sign up for our Slack there. I think we have several hundred people in our Slack now. 300, now. 300. so that's, that's pretty crazy for Youngstown. Um, and like I said, it still surprises me how many people we get, we get showing up to, to these things too. So there is a software developer network here, um, and, and we're always trying to improve it. So um, in, in Slack, we usually do like, what are you working on every week? We have random channel just for whatever random software stuff. A lot of times it's just people you know, throwing out links to things, throwing out security stuff, um, talking about what's going on locally a lot of the times. We always like to showcase uh, local businesses. We've had talks at the YBI. We've had stuff here. We've had stuff at the new library. We've had talks at Oak Hill Collaborative. There's been a really uh, huge amount of places that have hosted us, YSU, um, tons of places like that. So again, if you have somewhere that you work here locally that would be interested in hosting this, uh, please let us know that too. And we always say, uh, we're not proud or egotistical with the stuff. If you want to come run the show, just let us know. We would love more collaboration with setting up these things, um, hosting them, all that kind of stuff. So um, if you want to be Code Youngstown, come, <laughs> come, come take the reins. We're totally down with that. Um, the other thing we like to do is just, just link people with, with careers. Um, if people are just getting into the game and trying to find their first dev job, we've had a whole bunch of people that we've linked up, mostly at our summer mixers and winter mixers. Just We go around the room and we say, who's looking for work? Who's, who's hiring? And, and especially now with, with remote stuff, I, I, tell, I tell people, you know, they used to say Youngstown top 10 to start a new business. I, I say Youngstown now is the best place to be a remote software developer. because so we have the network and the people here. We have the people coming out of the university. Um, and now with remote work, we have some of the cheapest cost of living here, and it's just sort of a fantastic place to sort of grow that. So um, that's always fantastic. Um, and one thing I, I said at the last meeting, and I've been telling everybody around here right now, I don't care where you're working at right now. I don't care how comfortable you are. I, I've been comfortable in my gig. I, I'm guilty of it too. Start looking around, because right now there is just a crazy hiring boom, and it's all remote, and they're paying crazy salaries for some of this stuff. So. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to get in sort of a rut and at the same place for a long time, and maybe you're not getting what you think you're worth. Uh, right now, just with, with the environment right now, it's just everybody's hiring. Everybody's getting bombarded with rec recruitment emails. Everybody's getting bombarded with all that kind of stuff. So, so right now is the perfect time to really sort of uh, give yourself a kick and get in, into that interviewing process and, uh, you know, maybe find something that's, that's even better than where you're at right now. Um, what else do we have here? 
Let's go, young son. I, I will say, uh, Nate, thank you so much for hosting us for this one. Uh, I'm here. Yeah, please. <clears throat> if this is uh, your first time at Westside Bowl, um, well, I'm here like <laughs> six days a week anymore. They can uh, attest to that. But, um, I mean, I work here sometimes, just remote. I'll come get some food, bring my laptops, and just sit down and code for a few hours. The food's fantastic. They have live shows every weekend, almost every night these days now that things are starting to go. Uh, bowling, obviously, they have a whole separate stage downstairs, so there's always something happening. So go check them out, too, and they're always gracious to host uh, nonprofits and stuff like this. I've seen all kinds of events in this room, so um, definitely check this place out if, if you're not familiar with it. Um, I know a lot of people here. I see them all the time here, so it's definitely a great place to, to come hang out. Um, let's see. What else do we got? Um, the, the next event, we don't know what's next. If so we don't have a plan for the next event. If you have an idea what you want to see or you want to present or you want to host or whatever, let us know. We normally do a cadence of every other month, so uh, you have eight weeks to figure it out and let us know, and we'll help you or you would pitch an idea. Or if, if you're excited to do it, like we'll give you the reins. Um, yeah, but yeah, we don't know what's next, so we're, we're looking at y'all to help us figure it out. Uh, what do you want to see? What don't you want to see? Those kind of things. Um, I think that's it, Code Youngstown wise. Should we start with the lightning talk stuff? Yeah, we're gonna um, we're gonna rapid fire through a bunch of lightning talks. I think everybody everybody's gonna be time boxed. I think six minutes and six minutes max. <clears throat> six minutes max and you get kicked out at six minutes. We yeah. might we might do like one or two questions for each one. No questions. No questions for each one. I don't care if you have a question too bad. We'll we'll handle that afterwards. Um, <laughs> no questions. Forget you guys. Um, and then afterwards, it's just going to be social hangout, networking. If you know, ask your questions then because you're not allowed now. And um, and that's pretty much it. So we're going to get rolling. Thank you so much. Grab some food. Grab some drinks at the bar. They have a bunch of extra food at the bar too. So check out the menu too. And uh, you know, feel free to to go grab and do whatever. And we're going to get rolling on these. And uh, thank you guys so much. And hopefully we see you at the next one too. And we're going to be around if you have any questions or anything. Awesome. So yeah, I guess a round of applause. All right. Hey, I'm uh, Chris Palmer, and I'm going to talk to you today about the uh, coolest feature of Python, and in my opinion, the only reason to write it. Um, so list comprehensions, they're probably the best reason to write Python. It's basically a really cool way to do a lot of data manipulation very quickly with very few lines of code. Um, so you have a bunch of different types of comprehensions. First, you have list comprehensions, dictionary comprehensions, set and generator comprehensions. I'm not going to talk about those, but basically like a list is a sequence of elements where you've got uh, an ordering and all that stuff, uh, dictionary, key value pairs, and then the two that m people might not know about, uh, sets are basically dictionaries but with no values, just keys. And generators are like a list, but they get evaluated on access. So uh, list comprehensions. Um, this is like a super normal, normal-ish kind of thing you'd, you'd be doing in Python. You're creating a list and filling it with data. In this case, we're just iterating through a range uh, from zero to nine and then appending it to a list. Nothing interesting there. But with a list comprehension, you can write it as that in one line, uh, basically using those brackets and stuff like that. Um, the result's the same no matter what. Um, but you can do a lot of very cool things with uh, list comprehensions also in one line. Like you can implement a filter. So a uh, filter is where you're going to be adding things to a list, but um, you're going to have some kind of logic that's deciding whether or not each element makes it in. Uh, so here, we're doing a modulo 2 on it. So it's like, if the number is divisible by 2, then it gets added to the list. If not, it doesn't. Um, so here, the this, uh, this example, we're just using a normal loop, uh, looping through it, checking to see if it uh, is divisible by two, and then if it is, it add it to the list. Um, this uh, filter function, if you're familiar with uh, functional programming, there's map filter reduce. Those are the big ones. Uh, filter, you pass it a function. In this case, it's a, it's a lambda. That is going to return true or false. If it returns true, the element gets added to the list. If not, then it doesn't. Uh, same result there. With a list comprehension, same thing. Except here we have, uh, I have no idea how to actually do this laser thing. Oh well. Uh, here you have list comprehension, but at the end you have an if statement that's deciding whether it makes it into the list or not. Nice and concise one-liner. Um, so you can also do maps. Uh, map is where you basically are applying some manipulation on each item in a list and returning a list that has 
the manipulated version of each of those in it. So here, we're multiplying everything by two. This is just a loop where you're taking uh, the numbers in a range, multiplying them by two, and adding them to a list, or appending them to a list. Um, using the map function, you pass it a function that is the manipulation function, um, same thing. And then a list comprehension, which is just square brackets and um, basically you're doing the 4x in range and you're doing the manipulation right there at the beginning of it. All right, so dictionary comprehensions. These are the cool ones and this is how, um, back in the day if you searched dictionary comprehensions in Python, that's how you'd get sent down the rabbit hole of that weird Google uh, interview thing. Um, so dictionary comprehensions, same kind of thing but for generating dictionaries. Uh, Here's like a normal loop where we're basically iterating through zero to four, multi and then basically the key is each of those numbers and then the value is that number times two. Um, here we've got, uh, well, they moved uh, reduce out of uh, the regular uh, Python and it's now in a func tools library. So you have to import that, then you give it a function that takes x and y and that's going to be the previous thing and you have to, you, this is how you could make a dictionary with it. It's very confusing. I actually only discovered this use of uh, reduce very recently. I've always thought of reduce as like, oh, adding a bunch of stuff. And then the, the dictionary comprehension one, which is super simple, very easy to read, uses not a whole lot of concepts there. Anyways, so slick one-liner. I was doing a programming uh, problem the other day, like a coding kind of problem online on HackerRank, and here's the problem. Given a list of strings, find the most common string, return that. If there is a tie for the most common string, return the last element when ordered alphabetically. So there's a lot of complicated ways you could do this, but here's the answer that I came up with. Uh, basically, the first line, you make a lookup table with um, each of the strings in the uh, thing where it's like, um, here's the string and here's the count of it. But because the dictionary is only going to have um, one element of each, you're going to have like that easy lookup there. Then you, to find the, the the thing that has the most occurrences, you can just do that max function, pass it uh, lookup plus values, because that just grabs the values. And then this last part, I did a list comprehension, x for x in lookup. So it's going through each of those and then checking to make sure that the lookup is greater than or equal to, it should only be equal to at most. And also that last part that's cut off there is reverse equals true. Um, but basically it creates a list of hopefully just either the one element or or the um, the two elements that are tied and they'll then you sort them so they're alphabetical and then grab the uh, grab the first one and that's my whole talk thank you All right, hello everyone. My name is Anthony Hake. I'm the director of IT at Oak Hill Collaborative, nonprofit in Youngstown. In my spare time, I like to do tabletop gaming, but 24 seven, seven days a week, I'm a digital, uh, digital inclusion activist. Slipped my brain for a minute there. And uh, that's why we're talking about the digital divide today and why it's a problem here in the Valley. Right, so if we were to talk about it, we might as well know what it is. The digital divide is a socioeconomic issue that is plaguing the valley. Essentially what it is is that people are not valuing internet connection, their devices, or they just have lack of these things. And because they do not have access to them, they are missing out on opportunities that other people, because they have internet access, may be taking advantage of. So for example, we just recently had a gigantic pandemic and if you're vaccinated, how you went and did that was you probably placed your appointment online. Well, let me breathe for a minute. Uh, if you placed your appointment online, you just did something that approximately 1,463,384 people in Ohio cannot do, which is use a smart device or a laptop to access the internet to place said appointment. That is a lot of unvaccinated people, assuming you know they didn't later just get a computer, but. Uh, and some other statistics, just to kind of show you that this is a very large problem, specifically in Youngstown, is we are considered the 19th least connected city in the nation. 
That is absolutely mind-blowing. By the way, we're second only in Ohio to Cleveland, who is 16th. So yeah, that's what digital divide is. And a couple more stats, or just kind of why digital divide is a thing, is because, well, some people are low income. They can't afford internet. They can't afford devices. And as a result, they have to pick their battles. Do I pay my electric bill, or do I get Spectrum another $50 for the month? You know. Some people have to make these choices. Uh, another problem that we have is accessibility, and that's just, it isn't geographically available. And these are the folks that are like up in the hills who their only option is like satellite internet. And satellite internet is full, fully aware of the fact that they're the only option. So as a result, they rake these people for you know, satellite internet that's beamed from space. And another problem that we're having is just lack of digital skills or computer equipment. It's the mentality of, I don't have a car, so why should I pay for gas? So if people don't have a computer, they don't really feel the need to learn those skills. Or they may be embarrassed by the fact that they're so late in their life and they haven't picked up those skills. So they kind of develop a vendetta against them. It happens. Right, so funny picture time. Um, I pulled this from the internet and I kind of added my own edit to it. I really like it, uh, just ignore the fact that they're on the playing field in the last frame, that's not at all realistic. But it does illustrate the issue that we're facing with the digital divide. A lot of us are gifted with the skills that we have, the resources that we have, the equipment that we have. We're on that stack of crates up there. And meanwhile, there's some people who are just getting by, and then there are some people who don't have access whatsoever. Now, an example of equality was like a while ago, they gave just kind of generally low-income people free computers. Everyone across the board got free Chromebooks or like Winbooks, something like that. And as a result, it didn't really address people who didn't have an internet connection because, you know, internet's expensive or it wasn't available. So it was a solution. It just wasn't a solution for everyone. And equity, take a breath for a minute. An example of equity would be the emergency broadband benefit. I don't know if anyone has heard of it, but it's $50 a month off your internet or $100 off a purchase of a device from verified providers. So as a result, this diverging two different paths addresses multiple needs at once by getting people cheaper internet and getting people access to devices that they weren't able to afford before. It's an example of equity, which means that everyone is having their problems met. But the real solution, the secret sauce, is to get rid of the problem entirely. And that's done by using what we call a digital advantage or just spreading awareness which is what my workplace has come up with. We call it the digital advantage because it's putting together the, the resources that people need to be aware of what's available for them. So there's connectivity, tools, and awareness. This trifecta, this three-legged stool that we use gets people computers from nonprofit organizations like PCs for People. We sit down with folks and we help them sign up for a discounted computer. And then there's connectivity. An example of that, again, is EBB. $50 a month off your internet for a lot of folks, that's free internet. So we make sure that they are aware of this resource and we help them sign up for it. And finally, awareness. It's not just consumer awareness, it's also professional awareness. We as professionals are gifted with the knowledge of the terminology of what these people need. We can put to words the answer that they're looking for their problem. And as a result, we should stay in the know of developing policies like the infrastructure bill that's currently passing through the house and put those into layman terms so we can explain to people why they might want to pay attention to it. Right, so why am I talking about this here? Um, obviously, we're all very gifted professionals in our own right. We have digital skills, a lot of you have computers, and I'm assuming we all have some kind of internet connection. I'm explaining it here because we have the ability to give back and enable those who aren't as fortunate. And we can do that a whole bunch of different ways. We can do that by encouraging our workplace to donate old hardware to organizations like PCs for People because they're a national organization and they're still not getting the sources that they need to be able to redistribute their equipment. Time. Um, just look at all these websites. Be a part of it. <laughs> All right. Um, and then hopefully 
Okay, so I'm Mike Walker. I am a local developer. I have a startup. I teach at Youngstown State University. Um, I graduated from YSU. I went down to Vanderbilt. Uh, I thought I was a great programmer. I did ACM programming competition, things like that. I got to Vanderbilt and they're like, oh, okay, well, you need to work on this middleware. And so I ended up realizing, oh, uh, just a basic computer science degree isn't really enough to be working on large, complicated pro problems. So, um, anyways, uh, that's there. So, what are design patterns? Uh, raise of hands, who knows what design patterns are in software? Okay. So design patterns uh, are, here's some examples of uh, design patterns in construction. So roundabouts exist, and they're not anything in particular. There's no set patent on roundabouts and things like that. Bridges are the same way. There's general designs, you follow them, and then you have engineers that basically make sure that they shouldn't fall down. But the pattern is the same. Um, so software design patterns are a similar concept. Uh, who here knows about skill saw versus circular saw? Okay, they're the same thing generally. Uh, skill, the company, was the first company to make a circular saw. So people started calling it a skill saw. And same thing for sawzall and reciprocating saw. And the reason I bring those up are they're common examples of uh, naming patterns and conventions sticking and being useful when you're in that industry. So if you're a construction worker, somebody tells you to hand you, uh, give them a sawzall, you, you need to know what they're talking about. Uh, same thing as a developer, you need to know what the factory pattern is. If, you're, if you don't, that's fine, but you're gonna have difficulty uh, making the leap at, to a software engineer. Uh, Design Patterns, the first book. Oh, there we are. Uh, the first book came out in 94, I believe it was, and it started uh, gathering the top 20 or so most common design patterns that they were seeing in common occurrence. And these are what's called the Gang of Four, because there's four authors and then the pattern-oriented software architecture. The, these are a series of books about the concepts. The reason I know so much about these books are Doug Schmidt, the co-author on all the books from Two Up, was my PhD advisor. So I know I spent a, a lot of time talking about patterns with him. Uh, I won't go through this in detail, but you can read it if you want. Uh, the design patterns have classifications. They're structural, um, how are they, uh, or creational, that's the order, how are they created? Are you using a builder? Are you using factory, abstract factory, things like that, uh, prototype? Are they structural? So uh, are you using inheritance or interfaces to design these things? Uh, oh, and sorry, behavioral. Um, how are the classes communicating with each other? So, um, and this is really where it boils down. Um, who here has heard of the builder pattern or builders? Okay, who's heard of a factory? Okay, so you, you probably know what these are. And I've talked to Dr. Schuler and Dr. Kramer at YSU they weren't even familiar necessarily with all of these patterns, but they knew how to use them and what they were. It's just they weren't familiar with the naming. And that's probably where a lot of skilled programmers are. And all they need to do is learn the names and how these uh, patterns interact to take them to the next level so that they can, uh, well, let's be honest, interview better. Um, that's very important, uh, particularly with the current market. And then uh, once you learn basic design patterns, you can start moving up to architectural design patterns. And that is how do classes interact with each other? How do you uh, interface or connect different sets of classes to design a system? And then beyond that 
is system architecture. So do you have microservices, or do you have plugins, or are you peer-to-peer, -peer, those types of things. So there's a progressive series of elevation of complexity. And what about, well, there's a bunch of patterns that don't all fit into everything. <coughs> and I only cough at the end. So uh, feel free to ask me any questions later, apparently. So that's it. Thank you. Arm waves five minute warning. Yep, arm waves five minute warning. All right, my name's Chris Harwell. Um, I'm going to be talking about how to get into tech, a non-conventional approach. Um, how I got my first software engineering job and s lessons I learned in the process. Well, it's not working. The first thing is how to get the skills needed. Well, maybe this will come. <laughs> the first thing to get the skills needed that, in my experience, is to connect with people in your community. What you'll find is there will be some random person that wants you to build a project. At this time when you're starting out, you probably don't have the skills to get paid, so you just build it for free. Then there's open source work. This is pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to go into too many details on that. Um, yeah. If the button will click. Oh, there we go. The third thing for getting the experience you need is ask friends or family for project ideas. You, say you got an uncle that owns a mechanic shop, doesn't have a website, or even if he does have a website, offer to build him a new one. Um, you know somebody that has a problem, make new friends. Just find a problem that somebody has and solve it. Or if you're more creative than I am, come up with your own problems and solve it with tech. The second talk topic I'm going to talk about is interviewing. The first thing that I would note that you need is to have notes to ask the interviewer. When I was interviewing, I did probably two to 3,000 interviews in the past year and a half. Um, I applied to every job I saw. I don't care if they said, you want 15 years of experience in this programming language that I've never heard of and probably doesn't exist. I was applying because every interview that I got was a way for me to get experience. And eventually I got to a point where I noticed every single, there was, there was like 30 questions that no matter what, you were likely to get asked a number of these questions. So I would make a framework and ask the interviewer, if they didn't ask those questions, I would ask them questions about the job. The last topic, or second to last topic, is don't doubt yourself. This is a really easy, really, really easy trap to get into. A lot of the times, at least in my experience and from what I've heard, we don't realize the skills that we have until we're put in a position where we have to use the skills that we don't know that we have. My advice for this is to get really, really good at the fundamentals, like really good. And oh, I think I went too far. Nope, I didn't. My second advice for interviewing is find a comp the, what kind of company do you want to work for? Um, I thought I wanted to work for a startup. I worked for a startup. It was fun, but ultimately having a family, a wife and a kid, wasn't for me. If I was younger and I didn't have that, I would have loved it. Basically, essentially, this is find what meets what you want. Do you want to work remote? Do you want to work in an office? 
what do you want and look for jobs that meet those requirements and realize that the interviewer is not just interviewing you, but you're interviewing them because ultimately you're going to be working for them. And if you don't like where you're working, then that's not good for anybody. Get used to getting rejected. Out of a th two or 3,000 interviews, I got told no. Um, we regret to inform you email. I saw so many times that I was honestly surprised if I saw an email that was different than that. But I got so used to it that I just didn't care. The way I saw it at that point was your, your experience for me to get the next make the next interview better than your interview. And eventually I would find something that fit me. And that's my talk. You got it? Cool. Hi, I'm Joe Dunko, and today I want to talk about my latest side project, Star Wars Battlefront 2 events. Oh wow, that really isn't working. So like a lot of people, I got into Star Wars Battlefront 2 way after the game came out during its end of life period. Um, it's way better now if you tried the game when it first came out. Uh, it's free on, it was free on the Epic Game Store for a bit, and it's also with, on Game Pass. Uh, I got really into it, and while I was playing the game, uh, every so often, like every couple of days, I'd realize that at the end of game screen, at the bottom it'd be like, here's some triple XP or double XP or s something. And I was no wasn't sure where this came from. So I started Googling. Lies. So I started Googling and I found out that there's actually a list of events on the on Star the forum, the EA forum. But it's actually completely outdated. It's full of lies. And I was like, why isn't there just like some blog post by someone that just has a list of all the events and when they are? Like, that's super dumb that that doesn't exist. I was super mad and frustrated. And I was like, I guess I'll build it myself. So I decided to build it myself. Uh, I picked, this is my stack. I used Half Moon as the CSS framework because I had never used it before. Font Awesome for my um, icons, which actually has Star Wars related icons, so that was nice. I use date functions as my date library, which I'm using through ESM Run, which lets you use node libraries in the browser, which is super cool. I want to host it on GitHub Pages. I want it to be a PWA, so it just show up like an app on my phone. And while I was working on the PWA part, I started using this thing called Workbox to generate the PWA manifest. So I ended up needing to have a build script, which I didn't want to, but I ended up. Oh. So after I built it, I posted it everywhere I could. There were some subreddits, a Discord dedicated to the game, sent it to all my friends, Twitter, the uh, Steam uh, community for the game, posted it everywhere, and somebody got back to me that was like, hey, can you add a note about the event times? Originally, I naively thought each of the events happened just, you know, it's Tuesday, check if it's Tuesday. If it's Tuesday, there's a Tuesday event. No. All the events are in Swedish time. They last for 30 hours. They start at a very specific time in Swedish time because the servers are in Sweden. Doesn't make any sense. So I realized that while I was trying to figure that out, because time zones are horrible in the browser, everyone else was having problems with that too, including people spreading lies on the internet, could you believe it, about when these events were. So I was like, I'm going to fix this. Oh, come on. Come on. There we go. So this is what I came up with to fix it. I had a countdown timer. Uh, over there, it tells you what event's currently going on. If there's no event going on, uh, it tells you when the next event is and a countdown to that. I, I have a little seo event, or excuse me, about section. SEO is important. And each event ha is on a card like this. The website doesn't exactly work like this, but it makes it all right, look like this. But this is a nice little slide us format. So it's swbf2.events is the website. And to promote it, what I did is I found all those threads on uh, the subreddit where people were like, hey, when's this event? And I'd helpfully like say, hey, the event's at this time. And I must have made like 200 comments like this and posted a couple posts. And it ended up getting me actually quite a bit of traffic because at the end of every one of those comments, I'd say, hey, I made this thing that might make it easier. So here's my statistics. So in the last six or so months, I've gotten 20,000 unique visitors, which is super awesome. And at the beginning, you could see these spikes. Those first spikes were from Reddit threads that actually got uh, enough viewage that you know it made a spike. Um, and then the big spike is May 4th, because a bunch of people played on you know May the 4th. Um, and so now, 
most of my, uh, you could see that I have 10,000-ish Google uh, referrals. So now most of my content actually comes straight from Google, uh, which is awesome to see the transition from, originally it was almost all Reddit, and then after uh, all the backlinks kind of started developing, people now just find it natively uh, through the search engine, which is awesome. So a little postmortem. What was good is having some kind of growth hacking plan. It made it so I could get views. Uh, optimized for SEO, I made sure I had like alt tags on everything. A little, uh, the blurb repeated the same uh, keywords that I wanted a couple times. And stats really help motivate. I pay for a service called Simple Analytics, which is awesome. And it helps keep people's privacy. It just kind of checks if anyone goes to it. Uh, bad, instead of just writing HTML and CSS, I'd use Next.js because I'd rather just generate that stuff. I didn't want to build step, but it turned out I needed one for Workbox. And GitHub Pages super sucks for build scripts. And if you want to talk to me about that after, feel free, but it's horrible. You have to make some weird compromises. Uh, so I'd just deploy on like Versal and Netlify or something instead of GitHub Pages. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Five minutes, right. All right, today uh, I'm going to be talking about modernizing build systems. Uh, just some lessons learned from switching from Require.js to Webpack. For everyone who doesn't know me, I'm Sam. I'm a front-end dev at Drund. Uh, for everyone who doesn't know Drund, we build a technology suite that powers branded experiences. Uh, we're pressed for time, so read this slide. We got a huge application, a uh, ton of JS, ton of last files, ton of mustache on the front end. Um, because this talk can't be long, I can't really go into technical details. Um, really, but, the, but my hope is because we're not going to go into tech stuff, this won't be just pigeonholed to front end devs. Um, it can kind of be like platform agnostic, and we can talk more about uh, general steps and like your mindset going into upgrading your build system. Uh, so, why would you want to upgrade your build system? If you want a more performant view, uh, build, if you need access to new libraries, if you want to increase dev speed, dev happiness, those are all super good reasons to start thinking about upgrading your build very, very soon. If you just have, ooh, shiny vibe, uh, like, and you just wrote or uh, read a Medium article or like somebody dropped a new repo and it's like a new toy, you're probably going to want to proceed with caution. Unless it's like a personal project, if it's an enterprise solution or it's for your job, just proceed with caution. Uh, also, you want to think about libraries and what will be compatible before and after the build step. You don't want to convert your build and then, <clears throat> sorry, uh, convert your build and then like all your date functions just don't function anymore. Um, also, a small community and poor documentation are huge red flags. You are going to get stuck. You are going to get into the weeds and you don't want to be alone when that happens. So at Drund, um, we decided to switch because Require.js just kind of reached its peak in like 2012. It's still supported. Um, they're still pushing, um, you know, patches for it, but there's nothing really new. And um, Webpack has a lot of flexibility, and they have a huge community, and it just makes more sense for us moving forward. Uh, it also provides things like code splitting and performance enhancements, and you can get really granular with that stuff. And with Require.js, their build tool R was just kind of like a black box. You just point it at your build, and that's what you get. So having made this switch, um, I can identify four phases um, in retrospect that kind of like helped with the success of the whole endeavor. And they were preparing for the switch, selling it, executing it, and then measuring and maintaining it um, to prepare. Uh, really all I did, I took a Udemy course in like 2017 on Webpack 2 and read a bunch of articles. That's pretty much it. Um, I also did a bunch of little projects that were like hello world size and maybe a little bit bigger. Uh, the things that I would change, I would probably try and uh, take that course sooner than, uh, to like when we are actually going to switch our build system because Webpack 2, we're now on Webpack 5, that's what we actually switched over to, so I had some catching up there to do. And um, I really should have worked harder trying to find some sort of like open source uh, project to actually Webpack before just going like whole hog into our giant system. So after preparing for it, I also had to sell my team lead and our CEO and owner. And the way that I did that was I sold it as a bridge to React or Vue.js, some other like Vue layer library, um, and the possibility that we might have future performance enhancements. Uh, but to start, it would just be like a one-to-one -one conversion, just a straight swap out. And that was kind of like the undersell, hopefully over-deliver. 
Um, the only thing I would change here is actually being more adamant about this switch. Um, like I said, I've probably been talking about Webpack for like, I mean, Joe used to work at Drive. We used to talk about Webpack all the time. We've been talking about it for years and years and years, so really could have pushed for this um, a lot sooner. Uh, next came executing the actual upgrade. Uh, after selling the idea to management, I basically got two weeks carte blanche, like free reign, get as far as possible into this thing. And um, I came out of that having everything building locally and really only needed a few more pushes and some infrastructure help to uh, get it building in production, which happened a little while later. And um, this is actually the biggest thing that I would change. I had like, I thought it was gonna be fun. Um, I was like pretty naive about that. Hey, it sucked, it was hard. Um, it was like honestly emotionally draining at the end of the day. Like you're just error hopping for like days on end and that's, that can really, really wear on you. Um, when it finally did work, it felt amazing. But if I could have been a little bit like more realistic going into it, I don't think it would have been as stressful as it was. Uh, the current stage that we're on is we're just simply measuring and maintaining. Uh, we measure the outcome, make sure that we kind of sold the correct bill of goods, and um, we do tiny incremental changes as sort of our like maintenance strategy instead of these big pushes. So the impact of all of this is we did it. We got the one-to-one -one switch with our main uh, application, and uh, our branded applications have actually reduced 30% in size. And our local dev experience is a lot faster. Uh, in the past couple months, we've also included some non-AMD libraries, which wouldn't have happened before uh, without like hoisting or shimming them into our build. And we are currently scoping out our foray into React, which is pretty cool for us. If you have any other questions, if you're cur curious about Drund or you want to put in an application, you can go to drund.com slash page slash jobs. Uh, or if you have anything like front end related, you want to talk about build stuff, just want to talk about something, I'm on everything at Sam C. Alaska. Thanks again for listening. Please reach out. The, the best part is about 50 people in here have had their hands on this front end and drawn at one point, so. <laughs> And let me just give this one more try. Okay, we're good. Okay, so my name is Jacob McFall. This is Jason Sterner. We're both C Sharp developers by trade, but we work in mortgage software. Who here likes video games? <laughs> and who here likes or has played a zombie video game before? Probably a lot of people. Um, this is our adventures in developing an indie video game using Unity. Um, we've had some misadventures along the way. Um, we're very close to release this fall. So we'll kind of take you the approach that we took. It's not the approach. It's not the only approach, but it's, it's how we got along with it. So like I said, we're all C-sharp developers by trade. There's one more um, that is not here today with us. It's Rich Mullenkamp. He's an architect down at our shop. We had a common goal of game development since we were pretty young. You know, all teens playing video games. Um, some of the inspiration that Rich pulled from when he kind of made the first POC was a game called Armor Critical. It's a top-down 2D. Um, and then Faster Than Light, which is more of a, a roguelike game. Um, and of course, everybody loves a zombie game, so that's kind of how the, uh, um, the concept metabolized there. And we all did some Unity tutorials. Um, you actually did some games before, and we'll get to that later, because that's a fun story. Um, but then we started mapping out the concept and task with Trello, which is an Atlassian product. I know we have a lot of folks from the Atlassian user group here as well. The tech stack is mainly C Sharp. Um, it uses GitHub for source control. Unity is our main game development um, tool. Um, Photon Engine is our big networking component. Um, if you haven't looked it up and you're trying to get a networking game off the ground, it's the most approachable API that we've seen and it's also a service. Um, so you can actually pay for that and you have all your hosting and framework built into one. Um, of course, Steam API, we thought that was an obvious choice because most of us are Steam um, gamers. Um, and then of course we build and play the game on Mac and Windows OS. And then A-Star Pathfinding 
is another really great API that allows you to do pathfinding algorithms. So are things like bots and zombies follow you and kind of give that real gaming experience without us having to figure out all that difficulty. And then Sterner's gonna talk about some of our assets. So when it came to assets, we are not, no, none of us are professional artists or sound designers or anything. So we decided that it was better to just grab some that we could. We decided not to roll our own since it's our first project. Um, so some of the places we went to are listed here. We went to the Unity Asset Store has a lot of good stuff that you can just grab from, uh, from the store and just import it straight into your project. Um, Open Game Art has good art. Itch.io is a good one. Um, we did get one we did get a private artist for like a, a title screen, which was a good investment. Um, and as far as sounds and music, we went with Zap Splat in the Unity Asset Store. Basically, if you're not a total pro at that kind of thing, we recommend probably getting some free stuff. People won't care in the end as long as your game is fun. And that kind of gets into the product side of things, right? So game development is a business. At the end of the day, you're making a product. So if you can find things that are free, that are easy to download, that are easy to use, it's going to be better for you. There is some business red tape that we had to get through, like setting up an LLC. Um, we're a group, obviously not a sole proprietorship in this case, and we decided to split those things evenly. Um, we set up a business bank account. That's a requirement to setting up a Steam account, and there are some upfront costs there. Um, we had to do, I think, a $100 application just to get on Steam, for example. So the cool stuff totally does cost money. Um, and you gotta be willing to put some of that down. Uh, I personally had a little bit of experience with Unity and trying to do my own project before all of this. I was trying to do it solo. Um, I had an ambitious horror 3D game in mind, and it was just too much to handle by myself. Um, I got lost in a rabbit hole with doors, of all things, because uh, I didn't know what the player would do with them exactly and what the enemy would do with them and how they would react. It was a whole thing. Um, so all that said, it's a good idea to have a group of people because they can call you out when you're going down like this path that maybe isn't working out, or you're spending too much time on one thing, or they can just say, hey, this idea is no good, it's not working out, and you can retool some stuff. Um, and we did that multiple times during our development process. We went back and scrapped some things that we just didn't think were fitting. So it's always a good thing to get that input and have a, a good group behind you. And then we participated in some community events like Steam Next Fest. If you're on Steam, you might know about it. It's about a week, a week and a half time where they go through a bunch of product demos. We released a demo for that week and a half. We also did a bunch of live streams. This here is Axie McAx stuff on Twitch, if you're so inclined to follow that. Um, the next is up to you. So we'll pull up our game trailer, see what you guys think. And uh, unfortunately, there's not sound, but we'll kind of narrate what's going on. It's like a top tab area. <laughs> yep. <laughs> no. All right. So this is a uh, this is footage from our sync or from our. Uh, co-op mode, uh, you can play with up to three of your friends. Uh, so this is basically the story mode that we have. Um, so we have lots of explosions, uh, a, a good bit of different guns here. We have uh, different colored flashlights, which is the name of the game is Flashlight, and the different mercenary groups in the game have different colored flashlights to like designate who they are and whether or not they're going to have to fight somebody. Um, there's also zombies. As you can see, we have a kind of an old school score system that you can kind of see in the bottom right. Uh, the score will let you uh, bring in like airdrops if you get a certain amount of score. You can uh, get these perks as you go, so you kind of level up. And we have a couple branching paths that you can take to build your mercenary how you want. Uh, we have there's like a inventory system. we have an inventory system. Uh, you can collect scrap as you go and use it to build uh, barricades to stop zombies and mercenaries, and you can build turrets as well. I can kind of see it from here. I think right now it's in the okay. We have another mode there that's like. Uh, sh we're calling it flashlight mode where there's no ambient lights and it's only the built-in lights in the scene. So it's a little harder. It's not required, but we thought it would be fun to do. 
We have randomly generated maps. Uh, our friend Rich Mollenkamp, who's not here, he actually did uh, a whole thing that does these procedurally generated maps. So a little different every time you play. What's that? Curl and noise. Yes. <laughs> and that's about it. So we got a Steam page. Check us out. And we do have some handouts that have like a QR code on them and our websites and everything else and a little bit of the game art on our table there um, past our pizza trash. So if you're curious, want to get on there, get on our storm or our Steam store page, go ahead and wishlist us. <laughs>